most people don't understand that the only, the difference between the guy that wins the silver medal and the guy that wins the gold medal at the Olympics or the world championships or any championship is one is more in the receptive mode and one is more in the protective mode. And the guy that's more in the receptive mode wins the gold medal. That's the difference. The difference between uh, being the best version of yourself is how much stress you have. Most people are afraid to really look at their shadow or to go into their shadow. The challenge is, is that your light lives in your shadow. So you have to be willing to go into the shadow to retrieve your essence, to retrieve your light. Because, you know, one of the challenges, especially being in a Western world, is that people are highly critical of themselves. And I know this. I ran a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. Uh, people disapprove of themselves, people judge themselves unfairly, people even take overly moralizing positions over themselves. And they're expecting to be perfect, to do everything right the first time. And, you know, my message is really simple. Failure is the greatest part of success. And there's so many things at play that you have to step back for a second and go, hey, okay, who am I co-creating with? What are we co-creating and how can I show up in, in a powerful way? In a powerful way is to allow the moment to be the master, to allow the moment to speak to you, to direct you. And so if I show up and I've been listening to some really heavy music and it takes me 12 to 15 minutes to get into the flow with them and we're only meeting for an hour, they're really paying for 48 minutes of my time and my energy. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make a more conscious decision because there's a part of me that felt like I am not sure that they're getting the best value out of me. If I made the choice to get hopped up on sugar or caffeine or alcohol or any of those substances, what would happen is I would not be fully present with you right now. A whole aspect of myself would be in the protective mode because those substances would have put my nervous system in a state of fight or flight. And when you're in fight or flight, it's impossible to be receptive. Those choices are made weeks, months, and years before we even get to that moment. And so the thing to be mindful of is all of the choices that I'm making today are going to be impacting something or someone tomorrow or months from now or years from now. And so as I start to refine my vessel, as I start to strip out the tension and the stress and the distortion and the confusion and the anger and the anxiety and the self-righteous positions, what happens is I'm of greater use and of greater value. I, I bit my nails, I stammered, and I went to bed. Mm -hmm. And so imagine here you are in a boarding school, there's 15 other boys in my student home, and every morning I have to take my sheets down every morning in front of all the other boys, wash them, and then hang them up to dry. And then the other student home homes can see the back of our student home and I'm the student who's out there hanging their sheets because they're wetting their bed. The moment you start to recognize you're feeling anxious or angry or frustrated or agitated or fearful, all you have to do is raise your breath to the level of stress that you're feeling. And as soon as your body is met, with that level of inspiration and expiration, what happens automatically is the anxiety dissolves that quick. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, everyone was exposed, like let's go back 200 years, okay? Everybody was exposed to cold water mm -hmm. because if you wanted to get clean, what did you have to do? You had to jump in the river. You had to jump in the creek. You had to jump in the pond, okay? And the water was cold. <laughs> the only people who had warm water were people who had money people stopped breathing because 
they didn't want other people to know that they were upset or they were finding difficulty mm -hmm. with what the other person was sharing. And so they learned to what I call clinch, contract. And when you contract, you hold. And that aspect of yourself that you're holding in contraction, it stays there until you take it out. There's no walking anywhere. So when you're in SEAL training, you have to run everywhere. So if you're going to the doctor's office, you got to run to the doctor's office. If you're going to eat some food for lunch, you have to run to the mess hall. If you're going to the bathroom, you have to run to the bathroom. Like literally everywhere you go, you're always in high intensity motion. The good thing about SEAL training is it's very competitive. And you start to learn really quickly is, is that the guys that are the biggest and the strongest aren't necessarily, and the fastest aren't necessarily the guys that are going to make it through the program. It's the guys that have the most grit. As a man, I know from Pennsylvania, I'm trying to think if we ever had a conversation about feelings. Hmm. I mean, even with my friends, I mean, we joked in boarding school because that's what you do. You make fun of each other. You know, when I was in the SEAL teams and SEAL training, what do we do? We make fun of each other, right? But we never had an open, honest conversation about the negative things that were going on. You just kind of put those under the rug and you kept moving on as if everything was okay. And I Waking at dawn, packing the gear.